Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Julia. I was an admission officer at Haverford College, an outside reader for Emory University, and I currently work at Milton Academy, an independent boarding and day school outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. Good morning, friends. I'm loving these Monday announcement times because, for one, if we ever mess up and make a mistake at all in any way, shape, or form, we've got an opportunity to get a correction a couple days earlier than normal. So I want to do that actually starting out. So it's it's minor, but it's not really minor. So in the recommended resource, actually, for the last episode, 231, I gave the website universitystudy.ca, talked about Lisa and I experiencing the growth in requests for college in Canada. And I gave four reasons for it. I mentioned the (coughs) growth of the MAGA movement in this country and uh, particularly students with with more progressive politics being very repelled and preferring to be in a different environment. I talked about the cost benefits with lower costs in Canada to begin with, coupled with exchange on the dollar, and then also oftentimes some pretty generous merit money. I talked about the uh, gun shootings, rash of gun shootings in schools, and Canada being much, much safer. And then I talked about some students having an adventuresome spirit, really wanting to experience some different part of the world, whether it's Europe or, you know, or anywhere else, just to try something different and have that global worldview. But I realized I forgot a major reason, which is some of the most renowned universities in the world are actually easier to get into um, at Canadian school. So that's important, and I wanted to include that. Okay, our first announcement today has to do with something I'm actually really excited about. It's a new bill that's being introduced in Congress bipartisan bill, I might add, to transfer college savings to retirement funds. So this is actually really fantastic to me. Um, And I'd be surprised if it doesn't pass. It seems like the kind of thing that could get bipartisan support. So it's being called the College Savings and Recovery Act. It's being sponsored by Bob Casey, who's a Democrat from Pennsylvania, um, along with the Republican Senator Richard Burr. Uh, It's been a a past passion of his for some time. Uh, Actually, originally, Burr had introduced this in 2017 called the Boost Savings for College Act, but that couldn't generate bipartisan support. But perhaps this one will. So how does it work? Well, you know, we've often talked about the benefit of 529 plans, right? And there's a tremendous benefit to 529 plans because They allow a family to save for their children's education by using after-tax income similar to a Roth IRA, but you get the tax-free growth on the money, and then you also get a tax benefit, making 529s really powerful. There's only one challenge with 529s. What if your kid doesn't go to college? Or what if your kid gets a full scholarship? Well, You know, they've always said, well, you can always transfer the money to somebody else. And that works well if you've got multiple kids and it's the oldest kid getting the scholarship. What if it's the youngest kid? What if you don't have any other kids? So basically what what this bill would do is it would allow you to take any unused 529 money and transfer it right into like an IRA without any penalties. So you get to boost your retirement. And the idea is it can be an, more of an incentive for people to save for college, knowing worst case scenario, my kid doesn't go to college or gets a scholarship. Um, I'm not hung out on having to pay taxes in a massive way for that money. So I'm kind of excited about this. And, um, you know, we'll keep tabs on it to see whether or not it gets through Congress. 
Now, going to some bad news, University of Kansas cutting 42 academic programs. Massive, massive uh, financial shortage there. And um, I would tell you how, mo- how much, but I'm saving that for one of my big numbers. But huge, huge shortage right now in their budget. And you say, well, how could that happen? Well, I'll get to that in a sec, but let's talk about these 42 programs. Well, 28 of them pretty much consensus agreed programs that just had no popularity at all, no demand at all. So few people in them that they really didn't receive that much blowback. Um, However, the, the faculty committee at Kansas is pushing back really aggressively um, to try to stop the bleeding and keep 14 programs in particular from being cut. And these are some extremely popular programs that, you know, the university officials either feel like it would just be such a disservice to our institution to have a school that is not going to um, provide education. And we're talking about some major areas. So some of the 14 programs that the faculty members are fighting to include or continue to offer are things like the humanities, Latin American studies, Caribbean studies, visual education, visual art, and a series of minors, including some master's and PhD programs, you know, that span into a broad range of discipline. So how could this happen? That's definitely a question that we we need to ask here. And it has to do with the fact that when you look at state budgets, believe it or not, this goes all the way back to the Ronald Reagan era. They have been classified, and this is particularly more true in conservative states, as big government, as bloat. And they've been cut in favor of tax cuts, which is just passing on the cost to the consumer, which is one of the reasons for $1.7 trillion of student debt and parent debt number is becoming astronomical as well because at one time it was a major priority of states to cover higher ed. It's just not anymore. And so um, this is something actually Dave and I are going to do a deeper dive into is how exactly states are spending their money. But what I will say is this across the board, And this is based on a major study, a U.S. Census Bureau annual survey that looks at state and local finances from 1977 to 2019, only 9.3% of those dollars go to higher ed, or about one out of every $11 goes to higher ed. I want to go into this now and tell you where all the rest of the money goes, but I'll save that because Dave and I are coming up and doing that in the news. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, another announcement in, in higher ed, and this is always interesting, but George Washington University is changing its name as they are about to go into their third century. They have been the George Washington Colonials. That's been their name. And a special committee has been investigating this since 2019 because it's been dividing the community. And the special committee, actually, when they went back, they found that that name was not used, you know, during the colon- you know, colonial time frame. So for those who see it as well, it's a badge of honor, you know, recognizing the history. It actually was not used then. It's more used in Reconstruction. That's when it became used. So basically, the special committee identified a significant difference in the connotation for the term. And supporters... They see the term and they think of American colonies, especially those who fought for democracy and independence. For opponents, it means colonizers, those who stole land and resources from indigenous people, killed or exiled native people, introduced slavery into the colonies. And the university came to the conclusion that these perspectives just cannot be easily harmonized. And so it's best for us to search for something that the whole community can embrace. Haven't not announced the new name yet, 
They say they can continue with the old name until they come up with a new name, but they have announced that they will be changing the names. Just a little thing to show some of the battles that are going on in higher ed. Now, <clears throat> as you know, we're doing a series of interviews with deans of admissions, assistant vice presidents, VPs of enrollments, vice provosts, there's a million names, but the big dogs in the admission offices. And I just want to give you an update because most of our listeners will never have an opportunity to talk to somebody in that position. Some will, but most won't. And this is your opportunity to vicariously do it through us because we would like to take listener questions and ask them to our thought leaders. So I just want to give you an update uh, of which interviews have already transpired and which ones that you can still get in on and send your questions. So Bard College, that has not happened yet. If you want to send your question in. And by the way, if you're curious who we're interviewing, uh, we're putting that in our show notes for the foreseeable future. So that if you're driving and you don't, you know, have to pull over, write it, write this down. You can go in our show notes and see who's coming up for interviews. And if you see a school and it's of interest to you, please send your questions. Now, my preferred way is our Twitter account, which is at YCBK Podcast. And you'll see a message there. You can just message me directly. It's just easier for me to store it there because I don't get very many private messages, but I do get zillions of emails. But if Twitter's not your thing, uh, you can also use questions at your college-bound kid to submit the message that way. Um, it's also a preferred method for questions from a listener, too, by the way. All right, so Bard, that has not happened yet. Mercer hasn't happened yet. Oregon State hasn't happened yet. Now, that's going to be about a range of admissions topics, that one. The other ones are mostly about the particular college. Reed, so that one is going to be interesting. That one's going to explore how Reed basically <laughs> told U.S. News to go pound sand and why they did it and refused to cooperate as well as we're going to talk about Reed College. Uh, Rice University hasn't happened yet. St. John's College has happened, so that one's too late. University of Pittsburgh, that happens in three days, so that one's too late. The time you hear this, that interview will have happened. American University, that hasn't, that hasn't happened. Texas Christian or TCU has not happened. Michigan State University, that has happened. It's too late. Pitzer hasn't happened. Chapman hasn't happened. Connecticut College hasn't happened. Trinity College hasn't happened. Trinity University now hasn't happened. That one is going to be about athletic recruitment in Division Three. So send your questions if that interests you. College of the Atlantic hasn't happened. Spelman hasn't happened. Scripps hasn't happened. Uh, St. Louis hasn't happened. Now that's with their transfer specialist. So that's going to be any questions at all about transferring. You can send those our way. University of Connecticut has not happened. Colby College hasn't happened. Hamilton hasn't happened yet. University of Georgia hasn't happened yet. University of Rochester will have already happened by the time this airs. So that's just an update. Please send us your questions because our ideal scenario would be to take two questions from listeners and then the rest to come from, from our admissions team. The last thing that I want to share with you today is I just kind of want to give you an update on where things are at with standardized testing. I'm sure I'm going to miss out on, on an institution or two, but I'm going to try to give you a quick overview of where things are in the national landscape. So right now you have a very short list of colleges that are requiring test scores. The University of Florida system has always required test scores. They never stopped. In 2020, at the heart of the pandemic, they're the only state system that continued with them. And that's partly because their Bright Futures, which is their big in-state merit scholarship program, is, is partly tied to test scores. So it just would have been very you know cumbersome for them to uh, disentangle themselves from a core linchpin in their whole system, and they chose to continue with test scores. Um, and it hasn't hurt Florida State, who had massive surge in applications. So Florida, all the Florida schools, uh, they do require test scores. Now, Georgia did go test optional the first year of the pandemic, attempted to not go test optional in year two, but it was such a problem for so many of the 26 schools in the USG system, they had to reverse their decision. And the only schools that test scores were required for, once again, this is not made at the school level. This is made at the legislative board of governor's level. 
So Georgia Tech, Georgia College and State, and the University of Georgia. Now, those are the three most selective of the 26. So those three required. And as of now, Georgia's planning on being test mandatory for up-and-coming admission cycle, but who knows? They've been all over the place. And then a pretty big recent announcement that that came out less than a month ago, about exactly a month ago, actually, is that Tennessee, so the University of Tennessee system, the public system, they will be requiring test scores, going back to required testing. That will be effective for fall of 2023 applicants. So you basically have three big public college systems all in the Southeast. One that can't make up their mind what they're doing. Georgia's all over the place, but Florida and Tennessee have been pretty clear. And then other than that, you've got Georgetown University. And for Georgetown, they even have a caveat. So if you read their website, it says if you're unable to access a test center uh, because you couldn't take the test, then you can still apply to Georgetown. You just have to fill out a, a form explaining why you were unable to access a test center. Okay, um, so I'm not saying it's not going to hurt you, but at least there's a, a method. You won't be considered incomplete. And then, of course, we've talked about MIT with their big announcement. But that's it. Now, test flexible. So test flexible schools are schools that they really they prefer SAT and ACT, but they're open to reviewing applications without them if a student's unable to test. And But they do strongly encourage you to submit. And who are some of those schools? Purdue. University of Michigan would be in that would be in that group. And then the test optional list, at least for the upcoming class, is quite long. I'll just mention some of the more selective schools um, that are test optional. Uh, Amherst, Barnard, Baylor, Belmont, Boston College, Boston University, Brown, Bucknell, Carleton, Carnegie Mellon, Case Western, Claremont McKenna, Clemson, Colgate, uh, Columbia. College of William and Mary, Cornell, Dartmouth, Dickinson. Um, now, Davidson just made a big announcement in April. They were doing a three-year test, and they've decided they're going permanently test optional. So they're pleased with the results of their test, that they were able to select students without test scores and have them do well. And so some of these schools are test optional just for one or two years. Davidson has said as of April that they are permanently test optional. And some others on here, uh, Drexel, Duke, which was a late addition. They held out for a long time which always makes, gives me some pause because I know there had to be some kind of internal debate. Elon Emery, Fordham, Grinnell, Hamilton, Harvard, Harvey Mudd, Haverford, Indiana University, Iowa State, Johns Hopkins, Kenyon, Lafayette, Lehigh, LMU, Loyola Marymount, Middlebury, NYU, North Carolina State University. Shout out to my daughter, Joyce, grad student there. Northeastern, Northwestern, Oberlin, Occidental, Ohio State, Pepperdine, Penn State, Pomona, Princeton, Quinnipiac, Reed, RPI, Rensselaer Polytech Institute, Rice, Rutgers, uh, Santa Clara, Skidmore, SMU, Southern Methodist, Stanford, Stevens Institute of Technology, all SUNY campuses, Swarthmore, Syracuse, um, Texas A&M, Texas Christian, Tufts, Tulane, University of Connecticut, University of Illinois, Chicago, as well as Urbana-Champaign. Maryland. So you're seeing public and private in here. UMass Amherst, U Miami, Minnesota. That's the whole state system. The University of North Carolina, the whole system. Notre Dame, UPenn, South Carolina, USC. That's the University of Southern California. Both USC's actually. University of Texas at Austin. University of Vermont. There's University of Vermont public. University of Virginia public. University of Wisconsin Ver public. Vanderbilt private. Villanova private. Washington and Lee private. Wash U, private, Wellesley, private, Yale, private. I just mentioned some of the more popular schools, but literally I gave you the list of schools requiring the test. It's that short. Um, and then there's a group of schools that have said they are permanently test optional. Okay, the list I read were schools that are at least temporarily test optional. And so the list of permanently test optional schools is, you know, or at least for the next five or so years, there's, I'll just blow through this pretty quickly. You never really say permanent, things can change. American, Bard, Bates, Bowdoin, Brandeis, Bryn Mawr, Chapman, Colby, College of the Holy Cross, Colorado College, 
School of Mines, Colorado State, Connecticut College, Davidson, I mentioned already, DePaul, Franklin and Marshall, GW, George Washington, Hofstra, McAllister, Michigan State, Mount Holyoke, Oregon State, RIT, which is Rochester Institute of Technology, Rutgers, Sarah Lawrence, Scripps, Smith, Temple, the New School, Trinity Union, University of Arizona, University of Chicago, University of Colorado Boulder, Delaware, that's the University of Delaware, the University of Denver, Oregon, University of Richmond, Rochester, San Francisco, Washington, Vassar, Wake Forest, Washington State, Wesleyan, Whitman, Williams, and Yeshiva. So that's a pretty long list. And then as far as who's test blind, I know some people prefer the term score-free, test-free, whatever. I just like test blind, sorry. Um, but we're all talking about the same thing. Well, there's really 44 schools. So you have all 23 schools on the Cal State campuses. You have all nine schools in the uh, UC campuses. So there's 32 right there in California of the 44 test blind schools. And then you have some others like Loyola University in New Orleans, Pitzer, which is also in California. Okay, University of San Diego, also in California. WPI, okay, Worcester, Mass. Then we have Caltech right in Pasadena. We've got City of College of New York, which is CUNY. Now, this is at least through 2023. Dickinson, they're doing a test through 2023. Hampshire, permanently in Amherst. Um, permanently for Loyola of, of New Orleans. I mentioned them earlier. Northern Illinois, at least temporarily. And then Reed, you know, they're doing a study. So for the foreseeable future. And then San Francisco State, Stonehill. So those are some of the schools that are test blind. Um, and then I say Washington State, I mentioned them earlier. And then there's still Howard, which hasn't announced yet. So I don't know what's taking what's taking them forever to make an announcement, but get your act together because people need to know if they need to take the test. So that's just a little bit of an overview of the landscape. So where do I see this going? Well, I've been talking to a lot of leaders and Really, nobody I talk to thinks people are going to be following Georgetown or MIT. Occasionally, uh, somebody will throw out one name. You know, some people have speculated about Michigan because they have already indicated they like them. And they got like 86,000 applications this year. And there's some reports they just had the hardest time even finishing reading apps. But that's just speculation. And I personally don't think that will happen because of their commitment to access. So we'll see. Um, I can't think of a single school that is going to restore their testing in any anytime soon on the private side. If I had to predict who would maybe make the decision sooner, it would be another big Southern state school system like a South Carolina or an Alabama. But so far that hasn't happened. So I just thought I'd give an overview of where things are at in the whole test optional, test blind, test required, test flexible. Hopefully that's helpful. And friends, our interview is with David Feiss. He is the executive director of modernstates.org. And what modernstates.org does is they teach high-quality CLEP classes with top-notch professors from leading institutions. And so in part two, Dave gives tips for students to do well on CLEP courses. He explains why so few people have even heard of CLEP. He explains all of the different groups that Modern States serves very well. He talks about alliances they have with nonprofits and corporations. He explains how CLEP courses are different than MOOCs. Listen and enjoy. Those scores do vary from school to school, right? If it, um, the, the score you actually need to get credit? No. You know, people haven't paid much attention. Somebody somewhere sometime came up with this idea of out of 70 rather than out of 100, which is traditional. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, they all give credit if you score 50 or higher on a, on a scale of 70. And when people, by the way, when people take a modern states course, we also give them a practice exam, which is exactly like they're going to face when they actually take a CLEP exam for credit. And our practice exam is a very, very, very great predictor of how a student will do on uh, the CLEP exam. So, you know, if they pass our practice exam, they're very likely to pass the CLEP exam. If they don't, they may want to go back and brush up. You can, you can use, you know, our, 
you can go back to the course, go anywhere you want, anytime, and look at a certain section, uh, whatever you need to do. And by the way, uh, every six minutes in our courses, there are three multiple choice questions in case people were daydreaming and not paying mm, attention on their phone and, and, or, or in case they, you know, just were not able to comprehend and understand the material. So if you get the questions correct, you continue. If you get the questions wrong, you rewind, watch that section again, and then do the questions. And so, you know, we pay the $89 fee with a voucher that we send to students. Students sign up online with the College Board. Instead of giving them a credit card number, they give them a voucher number, which we provided uh, through email. And a student takes the test, and there's usually a testing fee of something like $20 to $50 or something, depending on the city. Most are around $20, $25. And we reimburse students uh, for their test fee, uh, their test center fee. Um, Or if they take the online course, uh, the College Board is using what's called virtual proctoring. Uh, someone actually, you, you take this at home or pull it on your computer and someone is actually watching you while you're taking the exam to be sure uh, that um, you're not cheating uh, in some way, shape or form. And so, you know, if you think about it, uh, there are a lot of college courses that get taught over and over and over again in a, in pretty much the same way across all the colleges and universities in America. You know, pre-calculus is pre-calculus. Calculus is calculus. We have great college professors teaching these courses and preparing students. These are college-level courses, um, but the teachers are engaging. Fantastic. So do you really need... Uh, you know, th- a thousand people across the country, uh, you know, teaching American uh, literature. Uh, you know, I understand that online learning is not for everybody. Uh, but, you know, with the benefit of the Internet, you go take that, you know, college composition course from us uh, and pass it, pass the course. Then you take the CLEP exam. And you pass that and, you know, we're providing a platform that enables people to um, get college credit for free. Um, It takes self-discipline, by the way. It's not easy to take a course online uh, for a lot of people. And uh, it's also not easy um, once you've started to finish. I always encourage people to set deadlines for themselves. Uh, so they get it done. And uh, in our New York program, actually, uh, when we started, I didn't think there were enough students really doing well. So I realized the great thing about our courses is that they're available any time. But for high school students, the great thing, the, the bad thing about our courses is that they're available any time. So high school students in New York City procrastinated and did, and they weren't doing the courses. So I said, all right, it's, you know, September, end of September. And I said, pass one of our courses and pass a CLEP exam. And you will not only get free college credit, you will get paid $300 for every course and exam you pass. And this is to really motivate the students. And I said, by the way, you have to do this by Thanksgiving. Well, suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, with, you know, with a deadline, people quit procrastinating. You know, hundreds and hundreds of students got college credit for free and got $300. And in this program in New York, uh, every student has a mentor. Uh, and if, if a student passes, uh, who's being mentored, we pay the mentor $300 also. Nice. So this thing was so successful after 
the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, I said, if you pass a course on a CLEP exam by New Year's Eve, you can earn $300 again. And by the way, if you pass two of these, you can earn free college credit, save thousands of dollars, but immediately get $600. I even used Amazon gift cards because we could get them out more quickly to people uh, than we could by sending them checks at holiday time. So so this is a fantastic question for you. It's been around since 68. So that's a long time. It's 54 years. CLEP has been around since 68. Right. Behind the scenes, we've been around. Now, we launched the program in the mm-hmm. fall of 2017. Right. So right. We've, been, we've been at it since then. But here's my question. Why have so few people heard of CLEP when it's so good and it's been around for more than half a century? Well, it's a, it's a great question to ask the college board why they haven't marketed CLEP over the years the way they have marketed the SAT and the AP exams. I think a big part of it is that when this was created uh, in the late 60s, these uh, CLEP exams were originally for adult learners and including and especially uh, those who were serving our country in the military. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you think about the College Board, they're very, very, very focused on high school students through the SAT. They're focused on high school students uh, with AP. And so, you know, CLEP started off with this adult kind of thing, doesn't it fit exactly with what the College Board does. And I think CLEP is also not well known and, and never became well known. And frankly, I think, I think the College Board also uh, just missed an opportunity. Um, things happen in, in organizations. And I, you know, I think CLEP is fantastic, a fantastic way to earn college credit for what you know or through modern states, what you get. So the, the bottom line is the College Board is, the, is a nonprofit but they had a lot of revenue coming in from the SAT and the AP. And this course just sat, this program CLEP just sat in the dark. Uh, Maybe they didn't think it was as good an opportunity and it was different because it was available to so many people uh, other than just high school students. Let's talk about all of the different people that could benefit from CLEP. So I could see this being very, very popular in the homeschool community. I can see this being very popular for adult learners who want to just have maybe intellectual curiosity about something and want to stimulate their brain. Obviously, we've talked about students who want to get college, come in with some free college. But what I could also see a student that, like you said, maybe a course isn't being taught at their high school and they want to take a CLEP course over the summer to keep their brain sharp and supplement what they're not getting in their high school. Um, Obviously, service people, you've mentioned that as another, you know, another constituency. Am I missing anyone else? Because that's, you know, it's already a pretty broad list. We have uh, a lot of people who started college and dropped out for one reason or another. Uh, And maybe they had to go to work. Yeah, that's a great group. I'm glad you brought that up. Whatever happened. So, we offer what is essentially a road back for students who may have started college and dropped out. Uh, this is a way to get back into it and earn college credits for free. I would say working adults uh, and uh, adults who have um, a lot of kids have a job, you know, and a busy, busy life at home. And our program is flexible enough that they can fit it into their busy lives. So they're super busy, but at, you know, 10 o'clock at night uh, or while they're driving to work, uh, they can have they can have our course on uh, on their cell phone and listen. Uh, You know, there's a there's a lot of ways this is being used by all kinds of people. And it's interesting. I have had students come to me who were lacking one college course to get their degree. They dropped out, they did all, they did, you know, 
almost got their degree, but they dropped out of college, didn't finish because they didn't have enough money uh, to pay for that course. They've come to modern states and taken one course, passed it, and gotten their college degree. So, um, you know, there's a mom who couldn't go to college because she had a daughter who was very, very sick. And she used to sit in the waiting room for hours at NIH, the National Institute of Health, while her daughter um, was getting medical care. While she was in the waiting room, she listened to and did modern states courses. And uh, she ended up earning, you know, the entire freshman year of credit, you know, and then we're talking about savings of, you know, I don't know, $10,000 or even $15,000, depending. Uh, it's a lot of money to save. And so, you know, it's used by all people in so many different ways uh, that, that I never thought of. I mean, colleges are using our program uh, as a way to try to get students uh, through their admissions process by, uh, you know, introducing more students to CLEP, get the highly motivated students who do it, and, and then recruit those uh, for your college. You know, we also have started this. Think about uh, folks who work for a nonprofit, and uh, we have a we have a program with a, an organization called New York Edge. It's a big nonprofit in New York that serves forty thousand uh, high school kids and other other ages as well. So, what do we do? We went to New York Edge. And we offered modern states for every single employee of New York Edge because they have employees uh, who needed college credit for one reason or another or wanted it. So now um, we are in a program uh, partnering with a nonprofit. And uh, suddenly everyone who works there and who wants to is using the modernstates.org program and earning free college credit. And this uh, organization is using it uh, to recruit employees also. Uh, they're, they're indicating, because people don't know, most people don't know about modern states and don't know about CLEP, when they go to hire someone or try to, in addition to all the other benefits, perhaps healthcare is the, is the biggest one, uh, they offer them uh, the opportunity to earn free college credit and they make our program part of their uh, recruiting process when they're, when they're trying to hire. So I never imagined people <laughs> would do something like that. And now I think, wow, I really ought to make a lot of nonprofits aware of this across the country because they can offer it to their employees. So wow. if, every day that goes by, there are more and more ways, more and more groups, um, partnerships um, that come along. And the, really, the full name is the Modern States Education Alliance. And the reason we call it Alliance is because our concept is to be right in the center of things, offering highest quality courses you can find um, online that lead to college credit. And we're at the hub of the wheel. And then we partner with colleges. We partner with high schools. We partner with companies. And so what we are doing is making alliances, uh, you know, and we are happy to explore partnerships with any, um, any group uh, in the country. And, uh, you know, uh, I make myself fully available to anyone and everyone who is a student in this program. So I give out my cell phone number, 202-439-0318. If somebody wants to call me, again, that's 202-439-0318. If you prefer email, you can email me, just my name, David Vice. V like Victor, I like Isaac, S is in Sam, E like Edward at gmail.com. Yeah. Uh, I am I am available to help anyone and everyone 
uh, who, who wants to take a course and pass an exam and get college credit and thankfully save money and save time. So another question for you, David, how is CLEP different than the MOOCs that you see out there? You've got Coursera. Now 2U has just recently bought out edX. There's more knowledge of these opportunities, in my experience, among Absolutely. high school students as a way of taking online courses taught by excellent professors at a low price. So on the face value, it seems like there's a lot of similarities. How are they different? The massively open online courses that are being offered at Coursera and being offered at edX are great courses. But, you know, MIT professors are teaching courses, making them available for free. Here's the problem. You can't get college credit for taking a course that is online that way. MIT is not handing out college credit, um, you know, and neither is uh, um, California State University. Uh, and, you know, so the huge, enormous difference in our program from, from MOOCs um, and even from Khan Academy, which is a mm-hmm. great resource sure. uh, and does tremendous things for learning, teaching. But, you know, Khan Academy and MOOCs don't lead you to college credit. We do. Yeah, that's a very big difference and an important distinction. And I'm glad you you underscored it. So are there different levels of courses? Like, talk to me about that. Is everything freshman year introductory? What range of levels are available for, for the learner? What's the, you know, talk, walk us through that. Okay. Uh, I think of these courses as all being college level courses equal to each other and with the following distinction. Some courses are a lot harder to take than others. So, for example, we created a track in math because people are all over the place in the knowledge they bring. So we have a college algebra class. Then we have a pre-calculus uh, class. We have a college math class. So we college math, college algebra, pre-calculus, and then we have a calculus course. So there's a ladder depending on where someone is in their uh, ability and understanding to do math courses. Uh, if you look at the pass, the big thing to look at, interestingly, the pass rate on these different uh, exams varies greatly. Uh, super high pass rate for Spanish and um, super low pass rate for chemistry. <laughs> and I think it's not because the courses are at a different level for each other, from each other, just like electives or freshman year courses in college. It's because the subjects are different uh, and people are tackling, you know, complex, maybe tackling a, a complex subject that is hard for them to grasp and understand. And, you know, if you're a native Spanish speaker, for example, um, you take our course, which will help you also learn about, um, you know, Spanish, you know, in writing. If you, if you don't know it, but we've got a lot of native Spanish speakers who take our course and the pass rate for that is super high. The pass rate in our program overall, well, the pass rate for CLEP nationally is like 65%. People who are using modern states, the pass rate is 75%. And in our New York City program, where we have mentors for each of the students, and these are uh, students from, from uh, communities that are under-resourced. Um, these are, these are students, um, who get free and reduced lunch at school. And guess what? The pass rate so far in New York city, we call it NYC freshman year for free. The pass rate, 92%. Good job. I mean, no one has ever seen a pass rate that high. So what's the difference between someone taking a CLEP course apart from modern states versus with modern states? 
there are some other opportunities to take courses around, Mm -hmm. but we are the only place that you can get college professors teaching courses that lead to lead to credit. Nobody else has a group of college professors doing that. And so, you know, if you ask me, what's the secret sauce here besides getting credit, we've got the highest quality of education and the highest quality of teaching of any program in this country uh, that prepares students for, for CLEP. A lot of them don't, don't have real teachers. They may have workbooks and other things, um, but, you know, we're the only program that has college professors and we chose college professors who were engaging online um, they're not hopping onto Zoom and, and teaching the way they always have. We did a very high production quality so that uh, the courses are, are more appealing to someone watching them. And the professors came to New York City to make the courses. And I would say mo- almost none of them did it for the money. They did it because they had a sense of mission about college being so sky high, too, you know, expensive. So here was a chance for them to go beyond the walls of their classroom at any college and reach thousands and thousands of people uh, in that subject. I mean, it's also a way for college professors to get their names out there uh, and to build a reputation. Uh, But I really believe that from talking with the professors that most of them didn't do it for the $5,000 $5,000 we paid each of them for the, and they did a tremendous amount of work, came to New York, spent, you know, 20 hours filming or more filming a course, being filmed for a course. Um, they, those professors believe in what we're doing to make access to college and access, I would say to make to help make access to college much, much easier and much, much more affordable. Friends, this concludes part two of my interview with David Weiss. We hope you'll return next week for part three. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 14. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel, and to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvic. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stalianos Dimitriou. If you want to have a coaching session with Lisa or me, Just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. By the way, check out our website, where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Thursday.